Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Ashby Hendrickson, and exactly two weeks from today, I'll be an alumnus of Troy. <laughs> Hopefully. Uh, but right now, I am still a senior. Um, however, I'm also a member of the uh, team of English majors that have spent the last five months planning this event. Um, and I have the honor and pleasure of welcoming you all to the 2023 Hallwaters Prize for Excellence in Southern Writing. Uh, this is only the second time since the pandemic that we've been able to host this award uh, recipient here in the International Arts Center, and only the second time ever that those of us enrolled in the English Majors Capstone Course Senior Seminar have had the opportunity to help organize this celebration. Um, having this experience before graduation has been incredibly rewarding in terms of experience, confidence, and responsibility. Uh, Troy University offers students countless hard, countless hands-on opportunities for professional experience outside the classroom. Um, this event is just one of the many avenues that Troy University offers its students for preparing for success post-graduation. It's also a lot more fun than writing papers. <laughs> um, before we get going, I'd like to recognize some of our special guests. Um, let's see. We have some of our Troy leadership and other distinguished guests of us today that I'd like to recognize. Um, Mr. Sohel Agwawala, Senior Vice Chancellor for Student Services. Um, Brigadier General Richard Boutwell, Senior Vice Chancellor for Advancement. And then we have, along with our deans, Dr. Michael Thrasher, College of Communication and Fine Arts. Dr. Jay Garner, College of Health and Human Services. Dr. Chris Schaefer, Library Services. And uh, Dr. Judson Edwards, Sorrell College of Business. And then our foundation board member, Jeff Kirvin. Um, I would like to extend a welcome to the 2023 Hallers Prize recipient, Terrence Hayes. Uh, and the family of Dr. Wade Hall, Mr. Greg Swim, and Tyson Hall. Um, And then we have some other guests with us today as well. Uh, from the city of Troy, we have Ms. Sheila Jackson, Ms. Catherine Jordan, Mr. Willie B. Williams, um, Ms. Ann Kimsey, Alabama State Council on the Arts. And then we have Ms. Jeannie Thompson, Alabama Writers Forum, um, Dr. Jacqueline Trimble, Alabama State University English Department Chair, Ms. Brenda Campbell, Johnson Center for the Arts, and Mrs. Tanya Terry, Wesley Gardens. I would also like to thank Miles Thomas for providing our entertainment today. Miles is a junior music industry student from Phoenix City. Um, and then finally, I'd like to ask Dr. Kernett to come up and say a few words about Senior Seminar. I have to lower the microphone after Ashby. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming out today so close to the end of the semester. It's been my pleasure for uh, almost 15 years now to sort of help organize uh, the Hall Waters. And I want to thank Greg, who is uh, uh, the, the partner of Wade Hall, who's been just lovely to work with this whole time in terms of coming up with uh, folks that we feel like deserve acknowledgement for excellence in Southern writing. And I also want to acknowledge that uh, because this is an English department award, that we have a lot of our wonderful English faculty here. So if you could just raise your hand and say hello to everybody. I wish we could. <laughs> wish I could introduce you all to them, but that would turn into a faculty meeting. So and I don't think any of us wants that. Um, I also want to say thank you to my dear friends Anne and Jeannie and Jackie for coming down. One thing I would tell you about Jackie Trumbull, who is the chair at Alabama State, she is also an, uh, an NEA fellow in poetry, which is no mean achievement. And we are deeply, deeply proud of her in Montgomery for having won that, uh, won that award. So um, a few years ago, I had an idea, how do I make this easier on myself? doing this award each year and I came up with the idea of why not make the students do it um, but the idea was we have a capstone course and uh, we use it as a way to prepare students professionally for things that they might do in English 
whether that is in publishing or arts management or in technical writing or any kind of professional field. And so for the past couple years, we've used that class as a way to sort of organize this event. So one thing I want to emphasize is as you're looking at the menu, the students were the ones that came up with uh, uh, all of uh, Terrence's works and came up with the menu items to go along with that and have a little fun with it. Um, but they also uh, did all of the interview questions at the 10 o'clock session, uh, if, you, if you were able to see the reading there. So I would just like to introduce them just briefly. Um, most of them are graduating, if not in two weeks, then at the end of summer. So Ashby Hendrickson, if you all would stand up, and Joshua Windus, Ashley Adams, and then Jeffrey, Jeffrey, Jeff, Jeff Dover, and then Mackenzie. And I, is AF here? She may have, AF, there you are, thank you. So these are great, very talented, and uh, you can sit down. Very, very talented uh, and versatile writers is the thing that I would wanna emphasize. We've thrown a lot at them this semester in writing things that maybe they're not accustomed to, uh, and they've risen to the challenge. So on that note, I would like to introduce my boss, uh, Dr. Michael Thrasher, who is the, the Dean of the College of Communication and Fine Arts. Dr. Thrasher just joined us this year, so he's completing his first year. And I just wanna take a public moment to say what a pleasure it has been w working with you since uh, last summer. It's hard to believe it's almost been a year since uh, we met. Uh, but Dr. Thrasher has done a wonderful job of sort of invigorating CCFA with a lot of, a lot of ambitions. Maybe a little more meetings than we need, but a lot of ambitions. Uh, and I deeply appreciate that. So Dr. Thrasher, I will allow you the microphone. Thank you, Dr. Kernett, for those kind words. And about the meetings, we should have a meeting about that to, uh, to talk that through. <laughs> No, it is a distinct pleasure to have you all here today. It's a beautiful spring day, a great time to come to the International Arts Center, and uh, we are so happy that you have made time in your schedule <laughs> to join us for today's event. If you would join with me, uh, we'd like to offer a brief invocation before we have our lunch today, so let's bow together. Lord, we offer before you thanks and appreciation and gratitude for your goodness to us, for friends and colleagues with whom we can work, for the beauty of creation, and for all of your good gifts that you so generously bestow upon us. We offer honor unto you in all things. And I pray in the name of my Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Brigadier General Rick Boutwell came to Troy in January of this year to serve as Senior Vice Chancellor of Advancement. After earning a bachelor's degree from Troy University and being commissioned as a lieutenant in the U.S. Air Force in 1991, General Boutwell went on to earn a master's degree from Air Command and Staff College in the National War College. He earned his wings at Vance Air Force Base, Oklahoma in 1993 it went on to fly the F-15, F-16, and F-22, acquiring more than 3,500 flying hours and 149 hours in combat. In addition, he flew as a demonstration pilot for the elite U.S. Air Force Thunderbirds. General Batwell served in the U.S. Air Force for nearly 30 years with his final position as the Vice Commander for 15th Air Force, where he was responsible for 13 wings, 800 aircraft, and more than 47,000 active duty and civilian members. He comes to Troy University as Senior Vice Chancellor for Advancement with a mission to grow Troy University by telling the Troy story and building institutional pride with alumni, donors, and friends through events such as the Hall Waters Prize that we are here to celebrate today. Please record, uh, welcome Gen Brigadier General Boutwell. Well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. And, and you know, let me say um, first on behalf of Dr. Jack Hawkins Jr., welcome to this lovely occasion. I've already said many thank yous. I'll we'll echo that. Um, thank you for being part of this and helping us honor these folks. Uh, to Tyson Hall, 
uh, the great nephew uh, of, of Mr. Hall. Thank you for being here with us as well today. Um, this ceremony continues the tradition that began all the way back in 2002 where Troy University first started recognizing outstanding comp contributions to Southern literature and the fine arts. I'd also like to take this opportunity to uh, pay sp special tribute to the founder of the prize, uh, the late uh, Dr. Wade Hall, and the who was the very definition of a Southern gentleman. Allow me to also extend a special welcome in a, uh, to this year's honoree, Professor Terrence Hayes. Sir, you're among friends today. Yeah. Most of all, we're here because uh, Wade Hall was a true Trojan. He was a member of the class of 1953 and was born just 30 miles away uh, in the rural, rural Bullock County. Dr. Hall said his decision to attend Troy shaped his life's work. In his book, Connecca People, Dr. Hall wrote that the Troy University opened a great new world for him, and that shares uh, just an outstanding testimonial. Upon graduating from Troy, Dr. Hall served in the United States Army before attending graduate school. He enjoyed a 30-year career as a professor uh, and the chair of the English department at Bellarmine University in Louisville, Kentucky. He returned to after Alabama after retiring, and it was a great day for our university when Dr. Hall chose not only to reconnect with his alma mater, but to designate Troy as the home of the Hall Waters Prize. Now with that, it's my pleasure to present a longtime friend of Dr. Wade Hall, a great friend at Troy University, Mr. Gregory Schwinn. When I think of Wade Hall and poetry, it's almost always in the context of Kentucky Poetry Review a literary periodical which lasted for 28 years. Founded as Approaches in 1964, the publication soon became known as Kentucky Poetry Review when Wade took over the editorship and solicited works not only by talented, largely unknown poets, but by those in the bigger literary world. Novelist Robert Penn Warren, All the King's Men, and critic Cleonth Brooks, both Kentuckians and distinguished men of letters, were jointly featured in the summer-fall 1980 issue of Kentucky Poetry Review. Charles Simonis of Harrodsburg, Kentucky, was often described by Wade as Kentucky's greatest living poet, and that was no exaggeration. Wade long championed his writing. The final issue of Kentucky Poetry Review in the spring of 1992 was dedicated to Simonis, and he also edited two collections by the poet. The Thomas Merton Memorial Issue, Fall 1988, of Kentucky Poetry Review focused on the poetry of the Trappist monk who lived at Gethsemane Abbey near Bardstown, Kentucky. Bert Merton, a world-renowned writer, wrote about spirituality and social justice in many forms, including essays, biographies, diaries, and letters. Others who were featured in special issues of Kentucky Poetry Review included Fred Chapel of North Carolina, a fiction and poetry writer, poet John Chiardi, and Kentuckians Wendell Berry, Jesse Stewart, and James Still. Still, who lived and wrote in the mountains of eastern Kentucky, was a native of Lafayette, Alabama, in Chambers County. Another Alabama writer and teacher, Sue Walker of Mobile, former poet laureate of the state, wrote a book-length poem about author Carson McCullers which Wade published in 2003 in the Conecuh series, Celebrating Diversity in the South, a series he edited for New South Books in Montgomery. The title of this lively narrative piece is, It's Good Weather for Fudge, Conversing with Carson McCullers. 
the fall winter issue of 1989-90 of Kentucky Poetry Re Review was dedicated to Ray Bradbury, writer of poetry, stories, novels, plays, and TV and movie scripts. He was perhaps best known as a science fiction and fantasy author. James Laughlin, whom Mr. Hayes makes reference to in one of his poems, was also featured in Kentucky Poetry Review in the spring 1987 issue. Although better known as a publisher than as a writer, Laughlin did write poetry. His greatest contribution to the literary arts was as founder of New Directions Publishing House, which published some of the most significant writers of the 20th century. As I learned recently, Mr. Hayes' book, Hip Logic, was a finalist for an Academy of American Poets James Laughlin Award. I also noted in one of Mr. Hayes' poems that he alluded to Ruth Stone, another fine poet who appeared in Kentucky Poetry Review from time to time. An issue focusing on her poetic creativity was published by Kentucky Poetry Review under Wade's leadership. Elizabeth Maddox Roberts, an acclaimed Kentucky novelist writing in the second quarter of the 20th century, had poet, poetic inclinations as well. In 1981, the 100th anniversary of her birth, Kentucky Poetry Review devoted a whole issue of Miss Roberts' poetry entitled, I Touched White Clover. Another gifted Kentuckian, largely unsung, was Susan Clay Sawitsky, a great granddaughter of 19th century statesman Henry Clay. A Kentucky Poetry special publication of her poetry entitled The Circling Thread came out in January 1984, a few years after her death. And then there was Louisville, Kentucky's answer to Dorothy Parker, whose style of bittersweet irony was brought forth anew in poems by Roberta Scott Bennell, a collection of Miss Bennell's poems called Eavesdropper was edited by Wade in the early 1970s. Wade was an admirer of the Alabama-born writer, anthropologist, and folklorist Zora Neale Hurston and was pleased when her work was rediscovered in the latter part of the 20th century. Mr. Hayes' Wind in a Box a was a finalist for the, for the Hearst Wright Legacy Award, which is given to black writers globally. Although Wade wrote poetry all 44 years, I knew him and put out a collection of his own works about 50 years ago, I would like to close by reading one later poem by him, which he was moved to write when he came upon the tombstone of a woman in the black section of the Bullock County Cemetery, where he is now buried alongside generations of his family. He was making a gravestone rubbing, um, <clears throat> gravestone rubbings of, of several graves there at Liberty Cemetery, and I remember assisting him that day. A copy of this poem, as well as the gravestone rubbing of Lucy Christian Stone, are now in the Wade Hall Collection of Southern History and Culture at the University of Alabama. For Lucy Christian, born in slavery, 1862, buried outside Liberty Church Cemetery, 1964, during the Civil Rights era. Now the reference to 63 and 65 in the first line of the poem or to the Civil War period and not the 1960s. For Lucy Christian, not reborn in 63 or 65, you wait, even now, outside, in the tangle of honeysuckle twisting chains, in the shade of cedars and pines defining your place, your name slutted under broken acorns and sand. You wait beside the sentinel fence 
enclosed by briars and bitter nettles, guarding your dust from the claws of wild assault. Now, in the natural chaos of falling doves and dogwood, perhaps freer than your infancy of ignorance or your later posture, nodding and bobbing below blue eyes, now, perhaps more liberated than the vaulted master holding deed, then mortgage to your white name, or the mistress locked inside iron gates, rusted tight. The lizards run freely through the fence. The pine needles cover both fields of dead, and the pulsating crickets keep company, singing alike to all. Thank you. All right, <clears throat> I'm back again. Um, before I get started with the uh, award, uh, we have two things that we missed. First, there's when we when we do get out of here, there's books out over there for sale if anyone wants to buy any. And um, I'm sure I would recommend them. They're very good. Um, and then we also forgot to thank uh, Miss Meredith Welch for organizing this whole thing. So I just wanted to. <laughs> All right. Terrence Hayes published his first collection of poems in 1999 before he was even 30. In the years since, he has published six more, including So to Speak, which is coming in July. He is also a noted essayist, critic, and visual artist. As our class read Professor Hayes' work this semester, we talked a lot about what exactly makes his poetry so compelling and unique. The English department's own resident poet, Dr. William Thompson, who also happens to edit our excellent literary journal, the Alabama Literary Review, <coughs> told Dr. Kerna that the quality he appreciated most about Mr. Hayes' work is a sense of gratitude it exudes. That's gratitude for mothers, for children, um, and maybe most interestingly for other poets. Mr. Hayes often stages his work as a dialogue with his predecessors. One obvious place we see that, as our class noted, is in his poem, The Golden Shovel, which appears in his collection, Lighthead. Mr. Hayes was inspired to create this form as he taught his son to memorize Gwendolyn Brooks, Gwendolyn Brooks' well-known poem, We Real Cool, which I look forward to teaching when I start my graduate career at Auburn in the fall. With The Golden Shovel po poem, poets enter a conversation with an older po poem they admire by using each word in a chosen line or lines as the ending word of each line of their work. In this way, the last word of each line reinscribes or recreates the inspiration within the work, literally handing it down. Poets will tell you golden shovels are not easy to write, but they are important in preserving tradition. Other students in our class pointed out additional characteristics they admire in Professor Hayes' writing. As one said, what I found unique about Mr. Hayes' work was a glimpse into his childhood that I perceived when I read Wind in a Box. Childhood is a dirt path that leads to the concrete of adulthood. To read his backstory in his own words without a filter was something that is not easily forget, forgotten. Entering into, the child, into, entering into the mind of a child and branching out to resettle into the reimagined mind of the older version is something the poet did phenomenally. Another student noted that Pres Professor Hayes' poetry offers an original and beautiful blend of contemporary social issues, pop culture, and classical prowess. Especially for younger readers, he's exciting to discover an allusion to Orpheus on one page and to the Wu-Tang Clan or, Gwen, or Genuine on the next. That juxtaposition tells us that all culture is the raw material of poetry. And what's important isn't whether the reference is elite or popular, but how the music and the mythologies that surround us are made meaningful in the context of a poem. It's just nice to know that nothing and no one are, are unworthy of being poeticized. Still other students note that the important themes of that, mis that Mr. Hayes' poems tackle are other important themes that Mr. Fame, Mr. Hayes' poem tackles. The meanings of masculinity, of blackness, of history, of love, of bridge building, and of continuity and, conti and continuation. Mr. Hayes is also very experimental, taking centuries old forms like the sonnet and reinventing them from within. As another classmate told us, he is all about the enjambment. <laughs> <laughs> what about the South? The whole waters, after all, is for excellence in Southern writing. Our class noted that American sonnets for, for my past and future assassin, there are all kinds of references to Southern figures, to Martin Luther King Jr., George Wallace, Emmett Till, Willie Nelson, and to honorary Southerners in African-American literature. 
like James Baldwin and Toni Morrison. There are mentions of Mississippi, Memphis, his native South Carolina, and Alabama. Although that reference, we should mention, reads, I would remodel Alabama. <laughs> Hopefully not this part. But Professor Hayes' poems remind us that Southern history is American history, and that there's nothing about America that is not touched by Southerness. For all of these reasons, we are honored to have you at Troy University, Professor Hayes, to honor your accomplishments and con contributions to Southern literature, by which we mean American literature. Um, once again, on behalf of my classmates, I'd like to thank you all for coming to witness this year's recipient, Terrence Hayes, accept the 2023 Hallwaters Prize for Excellence in Southern Writing. I know I speak for everyone, Mr. Hayes, when I say I look forward to the publication of your next collection, so to speak, in July. Your willingness to come to Troy University and share your talents with us is a gift I know the students, faculty, and staff all deeply appreciate. Thank you. Can you see us? Thank you, thank you. Who, is it Wade Hall? What do you say, Wade Hall? Mm -hmm. um, they told me to say a few things. You know, I didn't write anything down. I was happy to come here and just see y'all. And I kind of alluded to this in my uh, talk, the difference between fame and glory, uh, the unsung that came up um, as we talked about some of the people that were published in the Kentucky Review. And I just, I, I always think about it in terms of education, if that's the thing that we share here. This question of like, how long does it take to see the benefits of what we do in a place where, I mean, we talk about instant gratification and you might think of fame that way or the increased number of students who want to be influencers, which is, <laughs> I guess you want to be famous for nothing. <laughs> that shows my age when I say that. Um, but on the other side of that, this thing that we hear Maybe we hear it in church, but we don't hear it in our professional lives, is this notion of glory. This idea that what you're doing, if you're writing poems, or reading a poem, or teaching, or publishing a magazine full of people who are you know, poets, little known poets, that what that gives you uh, takes a little time to come to fruition, come to fruition, and it's in these moments. So again, I'm, I'm trying to say, I, I thoroughly, appreciate this prize, you know, I'm gonna put it in a special place in my home, but it's really just occasion to talk about um, these moments that are like the game moments around what we really do as a regular practice, which is moving towards like a, a, a game moment, moving towards the glory, and sometimes that takes 20 years, how long has this thing been happening, 30 years? Um, if, the, if you came here in 1950, that we sit here in the glory of something like that, like entering into the even, even for you, at the glory of entering into a space like this and then being here today just to see people and tell stories about the chancellor and uh, welcoming a person that you don't know on the premise of this idea that what we do is not really seen and not really about fame, but so much about like just reaping the benefits of the work, reaping the benefits of the practice of uh, reading and writing every day or being kind every day. So. Uh, that's all I wanted to say. It's a weird thing to say, you know, when you're getting prizes, as, as I do. Maybe this is why I say it. I just try not to take the prizes too seriously. Um, and I think of them as a kind of validation, but more importantly, a thing that just brings me into contact with people who know what I'm talking about when I say, you know, I do it for the glory, not for the fame. So it's nice to get this acknowledgement, but, you know, we go back to work and we practice our kindness and we give our students and our friends the love that we hope in 30 years will, maybe somebody will name a prize after them. You know what I'm talking about? It takes sometimes that long. So thank y'all, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff I could say about like what you mean to me. If you read the talk, you know it. Like the school I went to is not that different from this school. Uh, and I say to you, maybe someday they'll be giving somebody a prize with my name on it and I would feel like that would be enough. <laughs> so thank you, appreciate you.